everybody, it's Tony George from DocSports.com, and you can tell by the apparel here where my guest today has a collared shirt on and his hair gelled up, but I went old school because I got Chris Schmidt on here, ESPN 1480 lead host of Hell Varsity Radio, and they have dug up the Average Joe Sports Show as well from the archives there in Lincoln, our old show we used to do together when I lived there. And uh, Schmitty, how you been, buddy? I'm good, Tony. It's good to spend time with you. Two weeks from Saturday, time to kick off another college football season. And I can't wait. And I think, I think you wearing your Nebraska gear, this will be the year that Tony George is the the good luck charm for Big Red football. Yes, I'm back in Kansas City part time. I'm splitting time between KC and. Vegas, and I will be up September 7th at Memorial Stadium. Um, going to be tailgating with Chad Daffer, ex Nebraska player. Mm. Yeah, and coming up for the Colorado game, which I think is probably the most crucial game we've had in a while. See, if, I, I think we're done turning the ball over against them from last year. Maybe I'm not for sure, but nonetheless, we're going to be talking some Big Ten football and. And uh, Chris, uh, you went up. You went up to Indianapolis and went to Big Ten Media Day. And I guess first thing I was going to ask you is what you, what was your biggest takeaway from uh, spending three or four days up there? You know, I, I think two things. One, that there's a lot of justified excitement for the league. You have your two big leagues, of course, the SEC and the Big Ten. As nice as Texas is heading into the SEC, we'll see if Oklahoma survives their schedule or not, whether it's, you know, a nine and three baptism or a a seven and five or worse drowning for for OU. But then there's a lot of pride with the Big Ten, not only what Oregon is, what USC can become with the right defensive coordinator, what Washington has been, they've got a really good coach and coach fish, but everybody left town in an Uber uh, once DeBoer went down to Bama. And, and then there's UCLA that, I mean, they have talent there, but it's a job that Chip Kelly says, no, I'm good. I'm just going to go be an offensive coordinator at Ohio State for two million a year. I don't want the head job at UCLA. So the new additions obviously strengthen the Big Ten. You've got some programs that are on the rise. Nebraska could finally turn a quarter and be relevant, be what they were supposed to be when they entered into the Big Ten. What's Michigan going to do and going to be post-Harbaugh? Ohio State, the best team money can buy, and SMU actually agrees. And uh, you have uh, a situation with, uh, you know, a Rutgers team that is going into a third year with Shiano after a bowl berth last season at seven and six. So truly, 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 there's no weeks off in the Big Ten. Michigan State is predicted to be in the basement, but but their head coach won nine or ten ball games a couple of times at Oregon State. Really, it's Purdue and Indiana. And if you don't pay attention, they could bite you. Yeah, Indiana's, you know, they got them as a bottom feeder here. Uh, They got 20 returning starters. I mean, usually a team and a, with and, a, and, a, and, a, and a coach full of swag. Yeah. I mean, you know, you saw him firsthand front row and center up there in Indianapolis at Big Ten Media Day, and the guy carries a lot of confidence in, in 20, 20 starters returning. Usually when any team in a Power Five conference, no matter how bad of a year you had the year before, returns 20 starters. Um, there and you know, I had a year like that. They're gonna make you have no well, nowhere else to go, but improvement would be on the list here. A couple of teams I want to talk about before we get to Nebraska. Um, number one is let's just leave Ohio State out of the mix because we all know what Ohio State is, you know, and they're mm-hmm. t- they're up there with Oregon, um, in the polls, you know, at the top two or three teams in the country. We get that. George is clear-cut number one, you know, but at days in Michigan. Now, Michigan and Ohio State remind me of Nebraska back in the late 80s all the way through about 97. 
You can lose everybody that you want to lose. You just reload and you're still a perennial top five, you know, favorite every year in the polls. And you're able to reload and really not have that much of a drop off. But you take a look at Michigan here. Uh, they've got them preseason ranked ninth overall. Uh, many have them picked to finish third or fourth in the Big 12, depending on what publication you, you're looking at, what you put stock into. They have seven returning starters, Schmitty. On top of that, they lost their head coach. You lost a quarterback that was a first-round draft pick that now you know, sidelined for another year with a, 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 a busted-up knee up at the Vikings. You lost a running back, Blake Corum, who was unbelievable for them. And yet they're still carrying a lot of swagger coming into your this season. They're sitting at eight and a half wins, um, minus 160 in Las Vegas odds, eight and a half wins on their season win total. If you take them up to nine and go over nine, you got plus 110 on the number. But is that is that seem right to you? Is this a nine win football team with what they lost, including the coach? I the the, the coach had ample opportunity to screw up last year if he was a screw up. Yeah. And Sharon filled in. I mean, Sarbo suspended half the year. Yeah. So the guy won six games as an interim, including Ohio State. You have uh, still Edwards back at running back. He ran for 500 last year, but that one two punch, Nebraska fans remember uh, Dylan Edwards. I mean, just. Uh, uh, Donovan's an, an incredible ball player. And you have a quarterback in Orgy that he's more of a mobile threat, but they didn't really ask McCarthy to go win too many ball games. I mean, don't yeah. screw it up. Don't fumble the ball. Make a throw here or there and don't turn it over. And and he did. He did that. Now, Michigan lost five of their starting offensive linemen. Uh, Michigan also lost two of their part-time offensive linemen that were also drafted and their receiving core is going to be led by Lovell in the tight end for touchdowns uh, a year ago. And they're pretty good uh, defensively. Their interior is back uh, and they've got a, a really good back seven. So to me, it comes down to their schedule. They have Texas. Okay. This season that comes to the big house. They get Ohio State uh, this season. Week two is when they host Texas. They host USC. Uh, they're at Washington. Uh, you've got Oregon coming to to East uh, to to Michigan, and they have to go to Ohio State. So what do they do in those coin flip games? I don't see Penn State on the schedule, which is a breather for the first time for both schools. Yeah. That's been an elimination game for them. Yeah. So, no, they, they, I think they're right at nine. They could sneak into the playoff. I just, honestly, I like Penn State's lines of scrimmage a little better because they're, they're back for another year. Aller's back for a third year. The running game at Penn State's pretty dynamite. Uh, their, their edge rushers are good in defense. So, I, Penn State's schedule's not easy either. But Michigan's sounds downright downright a little bit dirty. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's my not, that's my difference maker. Do you think at any point in time that Penn State, Ohio State, and Oregon are interchangeable? Or is it just Ohio State and Oregon, and then Penn State a distant third, or is this a team really that uh, might be able to shake things up a little bit this year? They have enough juice back to shake it up a little bit, but they've, they've, they've turned the football over in those big games yep. against Ohio State and Michigan. And they've not had better quarterback play. They've not had better line play. James Franklin is, out of, out of his 10 seasons, if you would have expanded the playoff, he's in the playoff four times. Yeah. And so they're, they're right there. Do they drop off? I think, I think they're all right this year. They host UCLA, they're at West Virginia. Do they go pound Morgantown uh, on August 31st, or is that thing a tight ball game? Not sure. They're at USC. They're at Wisconsin, and that's a circled game for, for Bucky. They host Ohio yeah. State, and then that's uh, really it for me. I mean, they host Washington. Washington's got some dudes as well, but they're new. 
to Washington. I should say Penn State's schedule is more manageable to me than Michigan. That's why I'd give Penn State the nod over Michigan. But it's going to be Ohio State, Oregon, Penn State, Michigan. There's your four. And then we can talk about five and six. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking uh, a lot of people got USC, Iowa, and then uh, Nebraska. Uh, number seven in some polls, uh, other places they're as low as 10. Um, before we get to them, just one other team I wanted to talk about. Now, I was duly impressed with what Fish did last year at Arizona. He's kind of like a – kind of has a Matt Rule story to him. You know, mm-hmm. started out his first year like 1-11 and 11, and then 5-7, and seven, and then the year he had last year – and he should have had, he had USC by the short and curlies, and they left them off the hook at the last minute for a huge upset in that game. And of course, anybody could hang around with USC last year because USC couldn't stop grandma at Costco with a shopping cart on defense. No. So hopefully they're doing something about shoring that up and Caleb Williams to bail you out on every offensive series to counter punch is gone. He's uh, playing for the Bears now, but Washington. Minus 11, all 11 starters on offense, Schmitty. And DeBoer takes off. The entire coaching staff pretty much goes with him. Five returning starters. And their season win total is six and a half, dude. I is And they're in a new conference playing at places they've never played before and pretty much playing teams they've never played before, looking at schemes they really haven't ever seen before. How tall is the task for Washington to get over a six, six and a half win total this year? You know, they're going to have guys that if they, and, and Kalen DeBoer has recruited a certain type of guy, right? You look at Michael Penix Jr., who he brought with him to Indiana, then brought with him to, to, to Washington. They've gone and got self-starters. That's been the makeup of his roster. And guys that didn't go with stuck around. So they they, maybe they didn't play but 15 snaps all year. They were at least around a group of guys and a team that won a playoff game against Texas and then just didn't have enough – didn't have enough physicality to, to to hang with Michigan, which was everybody, by the way. So yeah. that's that's something that, all right, the guys that didn't play have at least been in a winning program, been around it. And uh, Fish has a standard and has an ability to, to motivate as well. So you'll have a team of guys that stayed that will have a chip on their shoulder. They're talented guys. And it's really going to come down to, can they just go do it? Six, though, yeah. doesn't that seem, doesn't that seem, I mean, your payoff better be incredible <laughs> to, yeah. to put any money on Washington. It's such a wild card. Yeah, you know, that half, that half, that hook on the six, I yeah. think. They may be able to get to six with a lot of things going their way. You know, coaches don't play games. You know, everybody thought Nebraska was going to have a huge turnaround last year with Rule. Right away, we're going to land in a bowl game. And, you know, they just don't happen out of the gate. Matt Rule is not taking snaps under center. He's, you know, we still, you're still dealing with kids that are, you know, in their 19, 20 year old kids here. And uh, I, I, if, if I had a pick on this show, it'd be playing that under six and a half wins for Washington. I mean, I, let's, I, let's, Let's ask the, let's ask the question too, Bud, about travel. That's going to be a real yeah. pain in the ass for the West Coast schools. Washington has to travel to Rutgers. That's cross country yep. flight. They've got to go to Iowa City. They have to travel to Indiana, and then in November they got to travel again out to Penn State, which is Siberia. Yeah, and Rutgers isn't going to be all that bad this year. That's going to be that's a tough place to go win there. I mean, a lot of people have got Rutgers, you know, uh, you know, in the mix at least. You know, they're going to give you a ball game. You can't show up with your B game against Rutgers. And they got a good head coach there. Um, our main focus on this show, folks, and by the way, this is Chris Schmidt. He is uh, 
He is the big deal over there at Hell Varsity Radio in my favorite town in America besides Las Vegas. That would be Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, ESPN 1480. Chris, before we get to the Huskers, um, tell folks how they can listen to you and catch you guys online. Especially, uh, you got various ways to uh, catch your, your action going on there. Yeah, Tony, thanks again for that. And uh, we're streaming on the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. So you can like and subscribe there. Watch the show daily at 4 Central on social media at Hale Varsity or at H Varsity Radio. You can watch the show live on Twitter. Uh, all the major podcast platforms is where you can download the show. And we're live Monday through Fridays at 4 p.m. Central, 7.45, Saturday mornings, Central Time for the weekend edition. And, yeah, and uh, KFORnow.com is where you can stream the audio as well. So, in any way you want to get down, if you can stomach uh, my my, my golf gear uh, and you can watch the show, or if you just want to hear an ex-smoker do that too. And you do some live remotes on Saturdays from various places on game days uh, for those home games. And I'll try and make it up there. And, and um, There's a Jim Beam all... waiting for you at the single barrel inside the graduate. Mother of all steaks, 200 whiskeys, one with Tony George's name on it. Man, that's like, that's like leading the Christians to the Lions. Oh, I'm on my way, ladies and gentlemen. You can catch me on one of those. Streaming networks on a Saturday morning. I'll avoid aperitifs until I get there, and I may have one. We used to, uh, we remember we used to do that show at Misty's down there yeah. in Havelock. We were doing the Average Joe Sports Show, and they kept bringing us cocktails during the show, and it was two hours long. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! What, what, what pacing oneself? Yeah, yes. pace oneself and don't turn it over. <laughs> there you go. Well, speaking of turning it over, let's go ahead and talk about Nebraska football now. Obviously, there's optimism in the air. Um, I say that with guarded optimism. Um, I had a lot of optimism in the air when Scott Frost came into the program, and you know we know how that turned out. Now, we've got more of a professional coach, a professional culture. Um, I, I think a... Uh, an outstanding individual that understands Nebraska's culture. I think Scott Frost understood it, but he couldn't somehow convert that over. I think Matt Rule has done a nice job. And, of course, they landed one of the biggest uh, recruits in the country, a quarterback, stole uh, Rayola from from Georgia, a five-star quarterback that's going to start for him. He looked good in the spring game. Now, bear in mind, it's, I say the same thing about the NFL preseason. Don't put a lot of stock into what you saw last week in week one of the NFL preseason. You don't want to put a lot of stock into what you saw uh, in the Nebraska spring game, but what I did see was impressive, and you saw a kid that is he- poised. You know, the spotlight was on him in that game. The Big Ten Network was spotlighting him. A lot of hype surrounding that particular spring game. And he came in there and performed, showed he had some poise, looked like he had good command of the huddle. Um, Obviously, the athletic skills are there, Schmitty. Um, But we take a look at Nebraska from last year, and we thought Matt Rule could do some things that Scott Frost couldn't do, but yet it kind of looked like same crap, different day. Nebraska last year was dead last in the nation in turnovers. Uh, they had five final drives that ended in turnovers, missed field goals or penalties that cost them the game. They were second worst in red zone scoring percentage in the country and third worst in field goal kicking percentage in the country. And they lost five games by one score or less, even with those numbers. And that tells you they were close, but no cigar. So are we going to light the cigar this year? Now, Nebraska has a uh they are a plus 5500 favorite to win the Big 10 championship which they're not going to do but and by the way folks there is no east and west division in the Big 10 this year it's just the two best teams uh that have the best 
the two teams with the best record are going to play in the in the playoff <coughs> for the title. So um, that being said, Schmitty, um, the outlook for Nebraska this year: seven and a half wins over seven and a half wins is minus one twenty five at DraftKings today. Um, there's a lot of people talking that Nebraska could start out seven and out. Now I'm not one of them. And so let's talk about Nebraska. First of all, let's talk about the overall feel and optimism in Husker nation. And are the expectations being managed in Lincoln and Omaha and throughout the state, or are the expectations way too high? No, I mean, the expectations aren't, all right, knock on the door in Indy. There's probably a little murmur that eh, maybe it could happen. But no, folks realize, and Tony, you lived here a long time. You know how smart Nebraska fans are about their football. They're so passionate, yes, but they're also intelligent. The reality is this, 4.6% of all carries by a Nebraska ball carrier ended in a turnover last year. Think about that. It's, that yeah. that's, every tw- that's every 20 totes or snaps that ended up in a turnover. Defense took the football away only 14 times. They sacked Colorado eight times and still got blown out. Because yeah. what? The levee broke. It was turnovers. And it wasn't some guy strip sacking Lawrence Taylor style. It wasn't a guy making a play. It was somebody dropping a snap inside the red zone. It was a red zone interception on a game winning drive. So what do you have? Do you have a football team that was five and three going into November, just needing one win fast forward to now you've got a competent quick. That's a re that's for real from a, from maturity and a, and a talent standpoint, he gets the bigger picture. He wants to go play on Sundays and the feel is not to, not to go make him go do it. Adrian Martinez, had to be a one-man band. There's there's help around for Dylan Raiola. The offensive line is tops one of the tops in the country with combined starts. Left, left tackle could be an issue with Teddy Prohaska going down with an ACL. But Tura Corcoran, yeah. the highest uh, recruit since Indama Can Sue back in 2019, uh, has had 30 starts. It's kind of put up or shut up time for him. Are you better with field goals? Do you hang on to the football? Do you force more turnovers? Nebraska is going to play. They, they are three hockey lines deep on the defensive line to go get the quarterback. There may yeah. be a reality where they don't have to rush five people. They can get home with four. Tony White's brilliant. You get him for another year. Tony, they have 17 to 18 starters returning on a five and seven football team. And the best thing about this football team is their leadership from the top down. You've got a grinder in Matt Rule. You've got excellent staff within him. You have detail-oriented practices. You have development. You have guys that played as freshmen last year that were good coming in, but they weren't wasted. They got better as the year went on because the coaches got them better. I think that's your biggest upside as to why you go and say, hell yeah, I'm going to put money down on that over seven and a half number. Their schedule is doable. I don't know. What we don't know is if this team is successful, how do they handle it, right? There's there's a process yeah. to being a winning football team. So do they beat Colorado? They should. I've seen a line out that says that game's minus seven. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, you, you have to beat Colorado. And then do you handle your business against Rutgers? Because Rutgers – is uh, a bit of a scary team. You're on the road at Purdue. You don't go on the road till the end of September. And then you have Indiana that you should beat. You're more talented then. But are you looking ahead to Ohio State? I don't know that they right. get to Ohio State 7-0, and but I think they can be 6-1 and or 5-2. and Well, you know, Purdue's going to be a bottom feeder. Uh, um Rutgers, uh, the good thing about Rutgers is we get them at home. We don't have to travel out there. That's huge. It's it's in in Lincoln and Yeah. Yeah. October. Here's a question for you. Yeah. Do 
the FPI says Nebraska is going to be in eight one score games this year. That's the prediction. How do you handle those moments? Whether the spread's seven and a half, it's eight, it's minus three, it's four and a half. That's that's the that's the real thing. If you're a decent team, you go five hundred, don't you? In one score games, that's been Nebraska's would, kryptonite. You would you would think so, and I think you hit the nail on the head with two two words: under Mike Riley, under Scott Frost. There's one thing we did not have, and you alluded to it. Two words: player development. It was not there. Adrian Martinez went to Kansas State and developed, and you saw his skill set on display last week with the New York Jets when he came in the preseason game. You saw it in the uh, USFL here when he got the MVP. You know, he did not develop under Frost. A lot of these players didn't. And I think all of those one those one score losses that we had last year those players have developed. We have a lot of them coming back. And those lessons learned and that experience with the talent level of the coaching staff that we have, I'm glad we kept our defensive coordinator because his alma mater, UCLA, was higher. And that was that was probably the biggest keep we biggest catch we got keeping him around, you know, on the defensive side of the ball. You've got a great coach there, you've got a great coaching staff. You've got a teaching coaching staff, and I think that makes the difference when the noose gets tight this year, Schmitty. And I, are we going to win every game right down to the wire? Probably not, uh, but we're not going to lose them all, give them all away this the year. I, I don't see that happening, honestly. No, I think you're going to have some poise. You're going to have some poise by those sixth-year guys that have come back, those fourth- and fifth-year guys, and it's really about winning. And it's about competition. And all you're into preseason week three and even today's media availability. I mean, the last 20 minutes were on the fly moments in situational football. 12 seconds on the clock, no timeout. Quarterback, you can't hold the football. All you need is three. Make a play. Don't be greedy, but don't be stupid. I mean, that's being right. drilled and drilled and drilled and, and drilled over on top of the fact that remember how they felt against Michigan State, against Iowa, walk off, against Maryland, walk off, and uh, against Wisconsin in overtime, walk off. That was their November, and it's a bad yeah. nightmare for a lot of those kids. The other part of this, it's going to be very rewarding for these seniors when they get to do this. That's get a stop defensively to win the game or to get the football back and then have the offense go in it. That needs to happen for this football team. It needs to happen once and then it can happen again. And it was up to the defense to carry this team a year ago. I'll give the offense in, in Harburg credit. They're a pro style offense. They resorted to option football because that's what they did best. That's what the, that's what the skills their quarterback did best. And they almost, still won six ball games. So you've got a very in tune coaching staff that have the players interest first. You see the importance. And I'm going to have you talk about this guy. And then we're going to talk maybe about your uh, get to thinking in your mind about maybe a sleeper team. We haven't brought up that might sneak up and be good this year, but we talk <laughs> about you've seen the importance in the NFL of the tight end, the Travis Kelsey's, the George Kittles, the the Mark Andrews at uh, the Ravens, and, and the list goes on, and how crucial those are to quarterbacks that can buy time, run around, and depend on them uh, for those, uh, those big plays when they're needed, especially in the third down situations. Talk a little bit about the talent level Nebraska has at tight end right now. Well, you have Thomas Fedoni. He was the number one ranked tight end out of high school, you know, back in 2020, 2021. Uh, he has suffered injuries to both knees. He got back healthy last season and was a primary target. They just couldn't get him the football. This year, 
He's a no nonsense guy, super big, super athletic, still moves well despite the, the knee issues. So you have Fedoni that is somebody to watch. You have uh, Nate Borkacher, another tight end, uh, small town Nebraska kid. Uh, yep. That is good. You have Borkature that's pretty talented. Janarian Bonner has spent time at H back. He's a six foot two, 220 pound, uh, just physical specimen out of yeah. Georgia that is going to see right. time in the slot. Yeah. Uh, and then on the outside, you've got uh, Jamal Banks, the Wake Forest first team all, C all ACC transfer, and Nayor that got hurt at Texas, but lit it up at Wyoming. So you yeah. are absolutely loaded with options uh, in the skill spots, but the tight end position is going to be you're over the middle, move the chains, get some yak yards, that physical attitude portion of the offense. And uh, yeah, you've got a good one in Fedoni who dreams of playing on Sundays. He's got a quarterback yeah. that can get it to him now. Yes. And the size six foot six athletic. Mm -hmm. Uh, good hands, comes down with the ball in traffic, uh, gets yards after the catch. He is going to be, I believe, I think he's going to have a great year and make some noise in the Big Ten in terms of uh, first, second team honors when it comes to all Big Ten at the end of the season. I think Rayola is the type of guy that can get it to him. Chris Schmidt, Hell Varsity Radio, Lincoln, Nebraska, ESPN 1480. Now, Chris, every year you mention a team, you come away from Big Ten media days thinking, you know, these guys might be flying under the radar uh, in terms of uh, a team that might make some noise that maybe that's not in the spotlight, not getting a lot of, a lot of press. Any one of those teams jump off the page at you uh, this year? I, I like Rutgers a lot. I, uh, yeah. I I love what they are, and that is attitude. That is physicality. That's that jersey tough with Wimsant at quarterback, Mon, uh, Monjai at, at running back. That kid's tremendous. Uh, and they won seven ball games last year. They won yeah. seven. They went seven and six last year. So, you know, Rutgers is is somebody to deal with <laughs> this year, uh, and they are coming to Lincoln, which is big. Watch out for Rutgers. What type of tone do they set week number three when they go to Blacksburg, Virginia Tech? Yep. That'll be the uh, the the measuring stick early. They host Washington, and then they go to Lincoln followed by Wisconsin coming to East Rutherford slash uh, Piscataway. They also travel to USC. I could see Rutgers with their schedule. They take on SC, they take on Wisconsin, they take on Nebraska, there's Virginia Tech. Rutgers could be a sneaky eight and four team this year. They avoid the big dogs, traditional big dogs out of the Big Ten this year. Yeah. And they've been a team that's going into you know year four. And each year they've had success. And they're all homegrown, tough dudes from New Jersey that Shiano really likes to to groom and sharpen. Shiano's one of those guys like Matt Rule. Did a hell of a job in college, goes to the NFL, didn't work out, goes back to college, turns around another program. You know, and he's got and I on I've said this it Colorado is not the big guy. I think Colorado's a piece of dog dung. They're like a dog turd in a cantaloupe patch. And Neon, D Neon Dion, you know, he's he's on a short leash, trust me. But I think that – As soon as his kids are done, he's gone, dude. Yep. September 7th is not the benchmark for Nebraska this year. It's October 5th against Rutgers at home. That's a bigger game. That's That is a solid ball club. If you beat them in Lincoln, you know, um, you, then you've got a bye week after that. So your yeah. all your focus is going to be on them. I think if they can put up a number on Rutgers, and look, a seven seven to ten point win, a three point win, I'll take, but a six to ten point win against Rutgers is a major statement because that's going to be a good football team this year. And that's going to give them some momentum going into, you know, the meat and potatoes of, of uh, you know, the end, the November, October, November schedule. And I think that's going to be a big game for Nebraska. And, and uh, 
And I'll be up there for that. That'll be the day. That'll be the day I come see the ESPN crew in Lincoln. Pre-game. I'll say this. I'll say this. I think to beat Rutgers, you need to beat Colorado. I think you need a little bit of, I think you need a little bit of, ah, we can do it. And there's, the the atmosphere is going to be nuts in, in Lincoln for Colorado. But this is, this is your, your physical throwback leather helmet ball game that's coming to Lincoln uh, in October with Rutgers. That's going to be a 21-17 ball game. Yep, there you go, folks. Well, listen, all things Nebraska football, all things Nebraska basketball on the rise as well. Obviously, we don't need to talk about Nebraska volleyball, but all things nope. Husker sports <laughs> goes through Hell Varsity Radio in Lincoln, Nebraska. And my good friend, Chris Schmidt, uh, tell Bill Bowman I said hello, by the way. I miss my buddy Bill. He's still hanging around. He is. We're, we're actually golfing tomorrow. So um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna FaceTime Tony George uh, from uh, the 8th Green. And uh, not, not the, the, the ninth Green at 9 trick, but yeah. the 8th uh, the Green. The 8th Green will we'll FaceTime Tony George. There you go. Bill Dolman, I, he's already famous, so I'm just here to make Schmitty famous. Uh, but he's that, now you're making me famous, being that big shot there in Lincoln. And, and what, what an outstanding program uh, they have up there at Hell Varsity Radio. Uh, it's tops in the Midwest in my book. Uh, Schmitty, they've got a, a plethora of on-air talent there. They'll give you some of the best insights on the planet into what's happening in the Nebraska Athletic Department across the board, as well as all things Midwestern sports to talk a little Chiefs as well. And folks, be sure and catch him uh, on YouTube. Just type in Hell Varsity Radio and they stream those and all those other outlets. You can find them on Twitter. Just search for them. Uh, Chris, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, talking a little Husker football, making me feel like I'm back up in Lincoln. I'm ready to go to Mulligan's for a cocktail now and really Whoa. get into it. We'll get, I'll go get a Corona ordered now, Tony. Yeah, please do. And then we'll swing by Amigos on the way out for some crisp meat burritos. So <laughs> do it all. I'm looking, looking forward to getting up and see you, Schmitty. Thanks for coming on the show, folks. Be sure and catch me at DocSports.com. See that free $60 account right there. Put that towards a uh, package for football. We're getting ready to go with some NFL preseason, Major League Baseball, and college football two weeks away. Thanks for stopping by today.